So. So good morning, everybody. So welcome to the um, <clears throat> to the next um, invited lecture session, and it's a, it's a great pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Fred Vermolen from the Hasselt University in Belgium. And before we start, uh, I would like to introduce him very briefly. So um, Fred um, formerly was uh, working with the Delft University in, um, in the Netherlands. And um, yeah, he has a, a lot of research topics. Uh, so just to mention them briefly, um, of course, it's modeling, mathematical modeling of porous media, but um, he has a, a major interest also in mathematical biology. So some of his um, projects are dealing with in uh, yeah, biomechanics, burn injuries, wound contraction, scar formation, and so on. So this is really very sophisticated and, and, and tricky, uh, porous media modeling, including um, biological media. Other research topics are computational mechanics. So also from the mathematical side, um, in particular, uh, moving meshes, moving domains. Um, and he's also uh, very much interested in working in the field of stochastic models and processes and uh, parameter sensitivity analysis. So this is a, a very short um, overview of uh, Freyd's um, research interests. And um, now I would like to give Freyd the, the floor to start his uh, presentation. And um, to, the, to the visitors, uh, please use the, the chat for your questions. So write them and we will pick them up and ask Freyd then um, after his lecture to, to answer them. Uh, okay. thank, you very much. thank you very much, Olaf, for your uh, kind introduction. Um, is, are my slides visible now? Yes. Oh, yes. very good. So, indeed, I'm going to talk about the modeling of uh, skin after uh, a deep in a tissue injury using poro and morpho-elastic models. And, of course, first I would like to thank the organization for giving me the opportunity to share some of my results, to, to share some of our results, I should say um in in this uh, nice uh, field of research okay so i hope so there's a, a long list of topics i would like to address during this talk but later on i learned that i was only allowed to speak during 20 minutes so that means that probably i can only treat the first four uh, topics but if time permits i can continue with the uh, extension of more elasticity, elasticity to um in which we also include poro elastics and that will be interesting from a porous media point of view. Um, first, let me thank my co-workers. I would like to thank Professor uh, Gabiede from the Saragossa University. Uh, she has helped me with co-advising one of my students. I would like to thank my PhD students, Alice and Alice Peng, uh, Manel Rarach, um, Ginger Egbert, Zhao Chen, and Daniel Koppenel, who have done a, a substantial part of this, uh, of this work. I would also like to thank um, the MSc student, Master of Science students uh, from Delft, uh, Marianne Schaaphoek, um, Duncan de Bakker, uh, Antonio Barion, Wilbert Gorter, and Wietse Boon, uh, when he was a bit younger, he was doing his, his uh, master's project uh, under uh, my supervision. You all have done a great job, or you are still keeping up the good work. Of course, I should also say, say thank you to my sponsors, uh, the Dutch Burns Foundation, who is sponsoring two uh, research projects. Uh, so they apparently trusted me as a mathematician. I'm the only mathematician that is, uh, that is using uh, um, funds from the Dutch Burns Foundation. Um, and no, normally people are using, uh, normally the people who are using their fundings uh, are, are doctors and uh, medical researchers. I would like to thank Stichting Technische Wetenschappen, which is embedded within the Netherlands Research Foundation, or NWO, as well as two projects from the China Scholarship Council. Okay, um, so first let me say something about burn injuries. And, um, well, of course, burn injuries are, 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 are terrible injuries, and they can give a lot of problems to the patients that, uh, that are subject to these uh, injuries. And one of the 
kind of problems that patients can have is that their scar may become hypertrophic. As you can see that here on the chest of this patient, you see an example of a, of a, of a hypertrophic scar. So this will lead to aesthetic problems. Of course, if you have a scar like this on your chest, it's not as bad as if you would have a scar like this uh, on, your, on your face. And I have seen, I've met people who, uh, who have this uh, type of scars also on their faces, which is really terrible. Furthermore, another uh, problem that patients can be faced with is the so-called contracture. Now what happens after a serious injury, and in particular after deep tissue injury, and I mean injury of the deeper layers of skin, what typically happens is that skin will actually contract. So there will be pulling forces that are exerted by certain types of cells. And these cells are called fibroblasts or myofibroblasts. And these cells will actually make the skin contract, which also gives a whole sense, which also gives you a sensation of traction over your skin. But Fred, can we stop you for a second? We do not see you slides being uh, advanced. We only see the first slide. Oh. I thought you meant to show some <clears throat> a second slide. Now, now we see it. Right. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Um, okay, so can I you put it in uh, presentation mode? Make it f uh, full screen? Yeah. Yes, Magic, that's it. Good well, morning. We already tested that this is not possible somehow. But yeah. you, have, you have to switch the slides manually. Yeah. And, but we, we tried it already before. It's not possible to, to use a full screen mode. Um, yeah, it's a PDF, so that was not possible in this case. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Now we can see your slides in, a, in the right order. Please okay, go ahead. Good. So did you see, okay, so this is a, an example of a hypertrophic scar, as you can see here. Um, furthermore, uh, an example of a contraction uh, in which there is an excess of wound contraction, um, uh, which, which can also lead to disabilities. Uh, so then the doctors or practitioners would speak of a contraction. As you can see that here, as you can see from here, and so you can really see that this foot of the patient has been immobilized in a very unnatural position. So this is really terrible and also leads to disabilities. Disabilities, in spite of the fact that this is not a neural problem yeah, that the patients are facing with, are faced with, or a muscular problem. It's just their skin that does not work anymore. Okay, um, well, this is not okay, of course. Um, the next slide, I would like to say something about therapies. Of course, there is a lot of therapies going on and the list is far from complete. But what you can think of is the application of dressings or certain ointments. And these dressings and ointments contain chemicals that will diffuse into the skin of the patient. And then the idea is that these chemicals will adjust, will adjust, uh, adapt the uh, behavior of the cells uh, of the patients in such a way that the cell will exhibit certain favorable properties. And so these dressings and ointments are often based on natural products. Uh, an example is honey. Another treatment is to apply a bandage in order to relax the skin a bit for the patient, or a mechanical fixation, a splinting. And the splinting would aim at decreasing stresses and strains uh, on the skin of the patient. The funny thing is that once a patient suffers from a burn injury, and so right after an accident, in many cases, these patients are unconscious. But as soon as they wake up, they start using their limbs, they start moving. And as soon as they start moving, then actually the skin problems would actually start to begin. So then they stick in. So the skin problems are kind of initiated, I mean, contractual things, uh, are initiated by the movement of the, the joints of, of the patients. And so for this reason, mechanical fixation is a very important way of treating or preventing um, this type of um, inconveniences. Another treatment is, another very common treatment is skin grafting or skin transplantation. And so this is normally applied to, um, to those skin parts of the patient that are not able to close. And so if the wound is not able to close, then they would actually remove skin from another part of the body and put the skin on top of, 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 the, uh, of the broken skin. Okay, um, so the objectives of this study are to provide the community 
with a tool that can be used to understand the evolution of skin after a serious burn injury. So that's the main idea. Another thing is, of course, we want to, and next to understanding, we also want to, um, to predict how skin is evolving over time um, if a given burn or a given scar has developed. And then, you can get, and then you can get some insight into how the scar is behaving, whether or not the scar becomes hypertrophic, or whether or not the skin is developing a contracture. Well, in fact, what I do is if I carry out one simulation only, then this would only mean that I calculate only one, uh, that I model only one scenario. However, there is a big problem, and that is that the values of many of the input parameters are unknown. And this is because of patient-to-patient -patient variations. You might think, you might realize that some patient, that, that the stiffness of skin depends on the, on the age of the patient, for instance. But it also depends on the genetic pattern of the patient, or it even depends on the gender of the patient. It depends on very many things, the lifestyle, and so on. So there's a lot of patient-to-patient -patient variation. So that also means that there is a lot of uncertainty in these parameters. So if we know about, if we are aware of certain bounds of these parameters, if we are aware of certain types of statistical distributions of, of, of these um, parameters, then we will be able to, um, to, 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 to develop predictions of skin evolution in terms of a likelihood. So then we are interested in having a likelihood, and for instance, a probability that the contraction of the skin will be worse than a certain pre-described contraction. Furthermore, we would also like to implement therapy. So we would like to know what therapy is doing on skin. So how does it change the behavior of skin? And does it give you any favorable properties? And if it does, then of course, we would like to, to devise which therapy will give us the lowest likelihood for complications like hypertrophic scarring or like uh, contractures. So these are things that we want to do. And of course, I have to admit, um, we are not this far yet. And in particular, the implementation of therapy, we are just taking our very, very first steps right now. So let's have a look at what skin looks like. So typically, skin looks, skin consists of several layers. So you can think of the stratum corneum, which is a layer of dead keratinocytes which are kind of upper uh, skin cells. Then there is the epidermis, which consists of keratinocytes, which are viable or alive, if you want. And furthermore, there is underneath, there is the dermis. And the dermis is a very complicated structure. The dermis consists of fibroblasts. And these fibroblasts are also referred to as skin cells. These fibroblasts are the construction workers. So they actually regenerate the collagen. And collagen is an extracellular matrix which builds the integrity of skin. Furthermore, and next to collagen and fibroblasts, this dermis also consists of tiny blood vessels or capillaries. And these capillaries are responsible for the supply of blood and of course for the supply of oxygen and nutrients to all cell structures that are needed in order to sustain the integrity of the skin. Furthermore, if you Magnify even more if you look at electron microscopy images, as you can see here underneath, then you will see that the skin consists, uh, collagen consists of polymeric molecules. And these polymeric molecules in embryonic collagen are arranged in a randomized way, which also means that their mechanical properties, the mechanical properties of collagen are relatively isotropic. However, once there has been a serious injury of skin, and once collagen has been renewed, um, then collagen looks more like what you see here on the right side. And then collagen will be more like, um, will, will be more, uh, the structure of collagen will be, in a, will be more structured and will be more uh, uh, oriented, which also means that you get an isotropic behavior. An isotropic behavior will actually guide the cells in a certain way, but also cause mechanical um, and isotropy. And so these are important things to be aware of. Furthermore, if you look at, the, at how skin is uh, developing itself after serious injury, so first there is this hemostasis phase, 
in which there is blood clotting, if there is a cutaneous wound, of course. Uh, uh, this does not hold for a burn injury in this case. There will be formation of fibrin by platelets and a release of a certain chemical, platelet-derived growth factor. This growth factor, or this chemical, will trigger the inflammatory response. The inflammatory response is the response by the immune cells, by the immune system of the patients. So the white blood cells like phagocytes, leukocytes, macrophages will enter the wound area and they will clear up the debris. They will clear up all the contaminants and they will also release another chemical, TG beta, which is triggering the proliferative phase, which is the next phase, which amounts to the ingress of fibroblasts. And these fibroblasts were the construction workers that were responsible for the regeneration of collagen, as I mentioned earlier. And another thing what they do is they exert forces on their direct environment. These fibroblasts can also differentiate into differentiated fibroblasts, which are called myofibroblasts. The word myo means muscle in Greek. And so that means that these myofibroblasts are a hybrid form between fibroblasts and myocytes or muscle cells. And these myofibroblasts will be the bodybuilders among the fibroblasts. So they will be exerting strong pooling forces on their direct environment. And they will also be responsible for an increase of the contraction of the wound. And then there is the last phase, which is maturation, which is a realignment of collagen and the death or apoptosis of unneeded cells. Okay, I can tell you, I can, I, can, I can talk forever about these things, but of course I will not be able to do that now. Um, so here you see uh, an example, uh, a microscopic image of fibroblast. And you can see here the, um, the, the, the different phases during wound healing or, or skin development, uh, inflammatory response, prolifer proliferation, and the maturation response over time. And what's important here is that, that during the proliferative phase, that there might be appearance of myofibroblast, as I mentioned earlier, which will be responsible for an excessive production of collagen and which will also, call, uh, which will also cause fibro fibrosis, fibrosis, as well as excessive contractile forces. So if you look at the modeling approaches for this problem, and there's a lot of versatile modeling approaches. You can think of the cell-based approaches, the dynamics of only one cell or a few cells, in which we also incorporate cell deformation, cell shape evolution. There's colony-based approaches, in which we incorporate many cells. Each cell is treated as an individual entity. The cell shape, however, will be fixed, and there will be cell division and death and differentiation, and stochastic or as random processes. There's continuum approaches in which we only consider partial differential equations. And this is something that I'm going to talk about a bit more in detail in this presentation, in which we have average cell quantities and partial differential equations. Cellular forces are expressed in terms of the cell densities. And of course, there's also cellular autonom autonomous models and which are applicable to all kinds of skills. But I'm not, not going to talk about this type of model. So the cell-based approach could be, as you can see here, a cell um, in which we also incorporate the deformation of the cell and also forces on the cell. And this is something that uh, Chiao Peng is working on. Furthermore, cell-based modeling, you see a, a, a large number of cells. And here you see an example of how we use um, um, uh, cell-based modeling or uh, cell colony modeling for the closure of a, of, of a wound. Um, let me say something about the computational mechanics. So, of course, in these modeling approaches, we have a lot of mathematical challenges. So, some of these challenges are um, stochastic processes, random processes, the uncertainty in the parameters, computational mechanics, and this is the backbone of this presentation, um, statistical evolution, evaluation of the uncertainty, as well as upscaling between several modeling skills. This is something that we are working on as well. So let me say something about morphoelasticity. So let's go into the nitty gritty of the um, um, computational mechanics that we are using here. But one of the problems is that if you look at the cross-sectional area of a wound, then you see it's actually um, um, evolving over time. You see that the wound is actually shrinking, contracting, which is caused by the ingress and proliferation of active myofibroblasts. And, as a, and, and later in, in, in time, there will be death of these myofibroblasts, which also means that there will be a release of these forces. 
If you use classical mechanical models like Hooke's law, like uh, Kelvin avoids physical elasticity, what you see then is that the wound area, the, the, uh, the cross-sectional wound area will go back to its original, to its initial shape, to its initial state. However, this does not happen in reality. So in reality, what you see is that there is some um, residual contraction, uh, which is permanent over time. So, and this is something that we try to model by the use of morphoelasticity. And there is also another plastic plasticity approach that we are using, but I'm not going to talk about this right now. Morphoelasticity has been developed for the first time by Rodriguez et al. back in 1994, and has been used by Gorielli and Malton back in 2000, uh, 2011 uh, in order to simulate elastic growth. And the, the paper by Gorielli and Malton gives a very nice introduction into the topic, into the subject. Plasticity and growth have been modeled by us in the application of burn injuries. So the idea of this type of more realistic model is that we consider three different um, domains. First, of course, we have the initial domain, okay, which is omega zero, and with coordinate capital X. So this is the original domain. And then there is a current domain, and so the wound might have contracted to, to, this, to this domain in which we have a coordinate small x. Furthermore, if you relax all the forces that we have here, then the wound um, domain will not go back to the original, to the initial domain, but it will go back to a new equilibrium domain. So there's a new equilibrium here as well. But it also means that if we have the deformation gradient tensor, and then we use the chain rule for differentiation and to decompose this tensor. So we have a tensor um, which is reflecting the, 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 the mapping from the initial state to the new equilibrium state, as well as a tensor that is mapping from the, um, uh, from the present equilibrium state to the current state. And, and this is how, how, and this is how, this is approximately how. Of course, we can also give a derivation of this, but I think I have to skip a slide in the view of time. And for the one dimensional case, it's fairly simple to, uh, to derive the problem. However, for a more dimensional um, uh, situation, it becomes a bit more complicated. And there, I would refer to the thesis of whole. So what we are doing is we solve the following equation. So if it comes to the mechanical problem, we have a momentum balance here, in which sigma represents the stress in the material, in the, in the, in, in the tissue material. The stress consists of two components. The, so this is the elastic part. So this is Hooke's law, let's say, and here we have um, Kelvin Voigt's component for the um, for the uh, for, for the viscous part. And so this so mu one and mu two are viscosities. So V here is the, the 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 material derivative of the displacement of the uh, at each point. So we solve this equation. So this is the so F here um, denotes body forces that are caused by cells. And by the cells that are pulling on their environment, that are contracting, that are making the wound contract. Furthermore, um, we also have an evolution equation for the uh, evolutionary equation for the, for the, for, for the strain tensor. And as you could see here in the derivation, and we also came up with, the with, with an equation for the strain tensor. So here we have an equation for the strain tensor, and this, and this strain tensor um, represents the effective multidimensional Eulerian uh, strain uh, tensor. So this is the uh, this is the, the, the strain between the equilibrium uh, situation, the new equilibrium situation, and the current situation. And then of course we can update the coordinates of the of, 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 of all the points, and we can also compute uh, we, can, we can also compute the uh, uh, current displacement at this point. Okay, so we have developed some numerical methods for this. So I'm not going to, uh, to, 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 to talk about this numerical method here, but we also did some uh, analysis of morphoelasticity. And then in particular, and we could also prove that the epsilon tensor remains symmetric at all times, if it's initially symmetric. Furthermore, for the one dimensional case, we could also uh, uh, prove that we have stability and that we also have monotonic convergence to an equilibrium and provided that this condition is satisfied. And we could also prove that in some cases we might not have uh, a stability, which is asymptotic stability, and that if alpha is positive and alpha, the alpha parameter was, was given in here, and this alpha parameter also denotes 
the extent of uh, morpho or, or permanent deformations. Um, so we have done, we have used this model for a simulation of burn contractions. So we have model vari variables of variables are the, the density of fibroblasts, the density of myofibroblasts, as well as the collagen density and a generic growth factor. And we have equations for morph elasticity, like I mentioned earlier. So we have a non-coupled system of reaction parabolic uh, or hyperbolic uh, reaction transport equations and we use a moving finite element method. So to, to show an example, um, so here you can see the, so if you look at the dots here, so these dots were uh, obtained for, uh, from clinical observations. So these are observations that were done by, at, at patients. And um, we have been able to fit our model, our morph elastic model in such a way that we could relatively well that we could reproduce these, uh, uh, these, these clinical observations relatively well. And this was done thanks to Daniel Koppenel. And so we, we are able to, to simulate these, uh, these uh, burn injuries uh, pretty uh, well, I think. And of course, I would like to, um, to, to give this computational platform to the doctors. I don't know how much time I still have, but um, um, I would like to, uh, to, to share this computational framework with the doctors. And um, one of the things is, of course, the doctors have never been trained to use finite element simulations. Furthermore, what the doctors also want is to have, uh, they also want to have a, uh, yeah, they want to have very, very uh, rapid access to computation, to, to computed results. So they want to have a very, uh, so they want to have, so they have very high demands or very high standards. Well, if you give the doctors a fund and package, packets, then they are not going to use it. So that's my idea. And of course you have to disguise this to fund and package packets very well, then they could use it. However, if you make it very user friendly, but however, the thing is that, that the computations are still relatively expensive. So they, want, they don't want to wait for hours in order to get access to likelihoods or probabilities of, of failure or success of the treatments. So that's not what they want. So they want, they want to have immediate results. So the idea is that we carry out finite element simulations and that we use these finite element simulations to train a neural network. So this is what we have done in the graduate, in the, in the master's project of Marianne Schaaphoek. And she's still, she's still conducting this, she's still doing this. And our first results look very encouraging. So we have a neural network that is able to um, reproduce our final element results. So for the one dimensional case, we already have quite satisfactory results. And then once we have the neural network, we can, uh, we can predict uh, probability densities and we can, prob and we can predict probabilities or likelihoods that, 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 that certain treatments will be successful or not. But then, of course, we go back to wound contraction and go back to the patients and for the doctors. So this is what we are doing right now. And we also have some preliminary results in, in two-dimensional cases. So for instance, here you see, this is a one-dimensional case. Here you can see the cross-sectional wound area as a function of time. So this is a, a best case prediction. And here you see a worst case prediction. So you can see that the predictions are pretty much OK. So you see also the goodness of fit, which is very close to one. And so this is a very nice result in this sense. So this, this, this approach looks quite promising. Yeah, and then, of course, um, we want the doctors to have an, an app on their smartphones or on their uh, iPads which they can, in which they can use the neural network, the trained neural network, to, to, in order to predict how the, how the skin of the patient is evolving. Yeah? And, um, well, of course, there's a lot of issues here. Yeah, with, with respect to clinical data, yeah, many observations are quite subjective. Yeah, if, you, if you look at pain scores, for instance, and there's also privacy issues yeah, from the uh, legislation. So, and well, we, we have some first results in two dimensions, which also look uh, promising, but I have to say that we have to train neural network uh, much better for this because the, the results mm -hmm. are not as good yet as for the one dimension. Uh, sorry for, for interrupting. Um, I think we we have to give the audience a little bit time for questions. Right. Um, if I'm right, we have to close the session in two or three minutes. Is it is it right? Is it right? 
so 9.30 is, okay. is our... Yeah. So, so may, maybe we maybe we give um, the audience uh, just a few minutes for yeah. questions. Please um, write your questions in the in the chat function if you have. Yeah, I was actually about to conclude. So in that sense, yeah. it's okay. Yeah. So when we don't have questions, uh, Fred, you still have two minutes for for wrapping up wrapping up your talk. Please go ahead. Okay. Sorry for interrupting. No, no, don't worry, don't worry. There's no, there's no problem at all. So, um, okay, so what has been accomplished? Eh? So we can simulate permanent contractions. We have a good agreement between simulated and experimental time evolution of the wound area. Um, well, we have some more uh, 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 clinical uh, implications. I didn't talk about this yet, so I think that I'll skip these. Uh, well, Sorry, who, who's talking? Okay. I think no. it was Majid who was talking, but I couldn't hear him well. Yeah. M Majid, please unmute. Uh, uh, can you hear me now? I'm sorry, yeah. I that was by mistake, but I just wanted to say in five minutes, the next session is starts. Yeah, 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 we are Three minutes. already closing. Okay, so yeah, thank you very, very much. Uh, I, I don't see any questions in the chat, so Fred, your talk was very, very clear. Yeah, no questions. And, and thank you. Nothing at all, but, uh, <laughs> yeah, but thank you very much. It, it's only a very short time we had, but it was really very interesting to look into the to the world of uh, biomechanics. And the the mechanical part is, is quite familiar no? when we look at equations and uh, yeah. uh, continuum mechanics. But uh, but how do you do you verify these models? Uh, because every person is um, is different and in, in, in the video. Yeah, so of course we were very happy that we could reproduce some of the trends eh, that we saw that, that were observed uh, uh, from uh, clinical observations. Uh, so this was uh, quite nice. So then you have some implication, then you have some uh, indication of the values of the, of, the, of the input variables, at least of values of input variables that could work. Eh? So I, I should uh, formulate it like this. Um, furthermore, um, there is a lot of uh, so things like the elasticity of skin, for instance, has been measured quite extensively. Uh, so, so we know we know these values pretty well. Mm -hmm. Of course, there is a lot of variation from patient to patient, and this is something we we have to deal with. We I'm not able to to deal with this uh, uh, explicitly, but what we do is we we take we take these variations uh, into account by, by assigning statistical distributions to these parameters. And then we sample from these statistical distributions and we carry out a simulation. And this is what we do very many times. So we get a Monte Carlo type of framework. Of course, we try okay. to do this in a clever way. And, and this will enable us to predict the likelihood or the, or the probability that certain, yeah, certain phenomena could occur. Okay. So, so this is the reason why I don't believe in a single simulation, but I merely believe in, in, in estimating or assessing the likelihood of that, that certain processes or certain mm -hmm. scenarios could take place. Okay. Hey, thank you very much again for your very nice talk. <clears throat> uh, sorry that we have to, to move on. Um, there's a very strict scheduling of the conference. So thank you very much again. And uh, I think uh, the the talk will be shared if people are interested to this so or people should directly contact you né, if they are in, Perfect. interested thank you very much Olaf, for uh, chairing this talk thank you and i have one small duty i should announce the scientific writing seminar which is today at 10 30. so everybody who's interested in this please um, sign in okay thank you very much Fred. i think we are already close now <laughs> Well, it was very interesting, this kind of um, um, seminar. And, and thank you very much for taking the time and giving such a great talk. Okay, great. and thank see you. you somewhere in future, face to face. Okay, thank you. Bye bye. So we are.